Freedom is a heavy load, a great, strange burden for the spirit to undertake. It is not easy. It is not a gift given, but a choice made. And the choice made may be a hard one. The road goes upwards towards the light, but the laden traveler may never reach the end of it. Man approaches the unattainable truth through a succession of errors. Affliction comes to us, not to make us sad but sober, not to make us sorry but wise. You will be required to do wrong no matter where you go. It is the basic condition of life to be required to violate your own identity. At some point, every creature which lives must do so. It is the ultimate shadow, the defeat of creation. This is the curse at work, the curse that feeds on all life, everywhere in the universe. The gravest error a thinking person can make is to believe that one particular version of history is absolute fact. History is recorded by a series of observers, none of whom are impartial. It is change, continuing change, inevitable change that is the dominant factor in society today. No sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the world as it is, but the world as it will be. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Each generation imagines itself to be more intelligent than the one that went before it and wiser than the one that came after it. Man is the unnatural animal, the rebel child of nature, and more and more does he turn himself against the harsh and fitful hand that reared him. It doesn't matter what you do, so as long as you change something from the way it was before you touched it into something that's like you after you take your hands away. The very concept of truth is fading out of this world, and lies will pass into history. Solitude, isolation, are painful things and beyond human endurance. For small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love.
When the Trinity nuclear test was done and Robert Oppenheimer said, we have done this before, he was speaking from an informed perspective. In the ancient Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, there is a reference to a bolt of iron charged with the light of a thousand suns. It describes radiation sickness. It describes elephants screaming and dying. It describes the shadows that are left on the ground after the blast goes off, all things that we're now very familiar with in the nuclear age. The same culture that described what appeared to be the use of a modern nuclear weapon also was describing things like anti-gravity craft that flew through the air with no sound called vimanas. These craft could pass right through a mountain, and they also used some sort of particle beam weapons. You have human-looking beings that are larger than the rest of us and have blue skin, like Krishna, and they also have extraordinary abilities. And in addition to that, you have weird reptilian beings called Rakshasas, who are also codenamed snakes. And these beings clearly appear to be of a reptilian nature. This even goes to the point that you still to this day have temples in India in which there are people called Nagas who have a human-like top, but then from the waist down, they literally have a snake's body. All of this stuff takes on a much different investigative hue once we look at the fact that the actual record of what we now know a nuclear bomb looks and acts like is dutifully recorded in these Hindu scriptures. So Oppenheimer was aware that this weapon unleashed a fury unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Prior to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the scientists were the rock stars. Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Marconi, Tesla. These were the rock stars. These were the people who made our lives so exciting that we went from essentially a primitive situation where in order to have food preserved, we have to have an ice box where literally pieces of ice are covered with sawdust, to now we have electric refrigerators. We have electric lights so we can read at night. We have thoughts being beamed wirelessly by radio and then eventually even pictures through television. This was so exciting. People could travel, transcontinental railroad. All these things were coming out that had never happened before. The private automobile without the need for horses. And then all of a sudden, the nuclear explosion shows that technology hit a screaming brick wall. We could not trust any longer that our toys would be the instruments of our enlightenment. They could actually be the instruments of our destruction. Exploding these nuclear weapons ended up basically acting as beacons to a number of ET races in our general area. The primary energy pulse that occurs in one of these explosions sends an energy that feeds back through the fabric of space-time. All stars, all planets are connected through electromagnetic filaments. Scientists call these connections the cosmic web. It looks like a giant spider web all throughout the cosmos. When a nuclear explosion occurs, it sends a feedback through this cosmic web. This is a problem because these extraterrestrials not only communicate through this cosmic web, but they actually travel through it from star to star. Therefore, when we detonated these devices, we sent out a signal saying not only are we at a certain level of advancement, but we're not at a certain level of advancement spiritually. Oppenheimer's key quotes revealed that he did not know what the effect of the detonation of the nuclear bomb would be. When they conducted the Trinity test, they were unaware as to whether or not this explosion would create a chain reaction that could actually destroy the whole Earth. And yet they proceeded forward because they believed that this weapon was the only way they could end World War II, and thus the ends justified the means. With how potent and how powerful these technologies can be, we can never expect to be able to handle them if we operate them from a low consciousness. When you raise your individual consciousness, when you actually make the effort to become more aware of an individual, that has a mirrored effect to society. 
It's the law of correspondence, as above, so below. So when you become more conscious of an individual, that makes society itself raise in consciousness. And when each one of us, every single one of us, begins making ourselves more aware, society itself is going to become more aware. Multiple insiders with credible military and corporate backgrounds have said that extraterrestrial spacecraft have appeared over nuclear missile installations and have completely powered them down. First, I'd like to briefly describe the incident that I experienced in March 1967. At that time, I was the first lieutenant, U.S. Air Force, stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. I was trained and assigned duties as a missile launch officer for the Minuteman I intercontinental ballistic missile. We had operational control over 10 Minuteman nuclear missiles. On the evening of March 24, 1967, while my commander was on a scheduled rest break, I received the first of two phone calls. Uh, the first call was to report unidentified uh, lighted objects flying above the facility. Well, they were hovering above the nuclear silos, and what was happening was they didn't attack the nuclear silos. All they did was shut down. Uh, uh, Captain Robert Salas had like eight nuclear tip ICBMs, and they all got shut down in rapid succession. And these systems have triple redundancy backup systems. So, and the uh, guards up topside were with their weapons drawn with a glowing red uh, saucer above the, the silo. And then the, uh, the UFO then went 60 miles to the other base and shut down their nuclear missiles as well. This has happened more than once. It's happened in uh, Brent Waters in the UK as well. What most people haven't heard came to me from two insiders, Bob Dean and Pete Peterson, where both of them independently told me that in the year 1990, all of the nuclear warheads in the US and in the USSR completely melted down, became radioactively inert, and even the missiles themselves would just sputter around and wouldn't even fly a straight trajectory anymore. Right during the same time that all of these nuclear missiles were literally melted down inside the warhead, we also have this amazing formation appear on a dry lake bed in Oregon. The Idaho National Guard has a huge mystery on its hands, and that is our top story today. During routine photo reconnaissance missions over Oregon, RF-4 jets spotted and took photographs of a huge carving in the desert over a thousand feet across. It has everybody talking. I mean, this, this is just something that, well, it chills you. How would somebody do this? It's incredibly time consuming. Uh, a lot of expertise involved had to take a long period of time and maybe a lot of money. From point to point is exactly 11 and a half degrees. Exactly. Exactly. And the, and the other ones, they're exactly 23 degrees apart. Exactly. No, no variation. No variation. And there's something else puzzling here, something that you do not see. You do not see tire tracks, the kind of tracks that might be made by a tractor or a plow. No tire tracks and no footprints. In Oregon, I'm Walden Kirsch for NBC News. The reality is that this is the same type of thing that's being done with crop circle formations, but on an even more impressive scale. And that mark was a symbolic statement from the ETs. The mandala, remember, is supposed to be a symbol of the cosmic mind, a symbol of the creator, the origin of the universe, the geometric nature of how everything unfolds. So they're giving us a message. They're showing us that they will make sure that we stay on track for this positive future that's been promised to us in over 35 different ancient cultures around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel 
the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. So when I uh, really think about the speech from Dwight David Eisenhower, his farewell speech about the military industrial complex, it brings up a lot of stuff for me. Um, I was uh, recruited to go off planet in 2006, and it seems to be related to the alternative three scenario um, that relates to uh, creating colonies off planet. Um, and the Mars colony was the planet that was being discussed during that time. And so when we hear about a warning like that, but we don't hear about the actual alternatives or agendas or ET government treaties and some of the things that were taking place, what was he really trying to say? Um, there's so many layers to the military industrial complex that we're starting to discover now. Um, and I've been definitely researching and digging real deep in order to understand really what he meant. And as many have uncovered and been a whistleblower for and just my own experience uh, in that Mars recruitment, we discover a secret space program, um, this multi-level uh, shadow government uh, with compartmentalism, um, things that happened after the Second World War and the infiltration coming in from Project Paperclip to the American government, MK Ultra having so many branches. So it's like, okay, here's a warning about the misplaced power that exists and will persist if we as an American people don't start to become empowered, which is basically what I got from it. I, I could feel a lot of pride in a lot of my family members about that speech. Uh, but I would say that I'm uh, a family member that has, I think, recognized some layers that were not brought to my attention growing up, that I've been able to sort of uh, share with them. And again, there's compartmentalism. Uh, the NSA signed something in 1947 that made it legal, like a law that you can disclose this sort of stuff without massive ramifications. And here we are in this particular window um, without oaths being signed by many of us, uh, with, with more freedom of speech and more of an ability um, to bring light to all of this. And that's why the speech is really relevant because it rings true to today. Those warnings are something that we're beginning to finally uncover. Actually started back in 1955 with the Eisenhower administration that was forced uh, into, into a treaty, somewhat of a surrender with uh, a Nazi faction that had been operating. The, um, one of the witnesses that uh, was General Brigadier, uh, Brigadier General Stephen Lumpkin, who uh, was on Eisenhower's staff, who was aware that he lost control to the corporations and that uh, it would not be in the best of hands. And so once this treaty was signed, Nelson Rockefeller restructured the whole CIA MJ-12 operations. So now our legal government is no longer uh, in the loop. They also replaced the complete MJ-12 group that was originally set up by President Truman with Alan Dulles as MJ-1, or head of the MJ-12 operations, uh, of all people, who was highly instrumental in the Nazi infiltration. Uh, what happened was, when this happened, all of the reverse engineering operations that were Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio were moved to Area 51 and S-4, where um, Eisenhower realized that he had lost control when he attempted to look into it. He was denied access. Uh, here, a, you know, a five-star general was really pissed, so he, uh, he threatened to invade Area 51 with the first army out of Colorado. And they, until they allowed two agents to give a report of what's going on over there. And what they found was that several craft were being reverse engineered that were extraterrestrial and uh, German origin. One of the ways that the Nazis obtained their advanced technology before World War II was through the use of a channeler called Maria Orsic. Maria Orsic was channeling telepathic messages from extraterrestrials that were offering her plans and schematics to actually create anti-gravity craft. Maria Orsic channeled this information for the Occult Vril Society in Germany. This information was later used by these German secret societies to build out many of their crafts. 
Because they were focused more on the qualitative superiority rather than the quantitative, they were more focused on having more advanced technology rather than more tanks and boots on the ground, they were losing the ground war in Europe but they were obtaining the more advanced technology. And to save that technology, they took it down to Antarctica pre and during World War II. In the late 1930s, the Nazis had an expeditionary uh, group go down to Antarctica, and they found some very interesting things. They found a region under the ice that was created by geothermal heat from uh, volcanoes, and there would be three miles of ice, and a few thousand feet above ground level would have been melted by the geothermal heat. And the rest of the ice acts as an insulator, causing it sort of like an igloo effect. And the dome would grow from the heat, uh, the geothermal heat, and it would melt and uh, run under the ice. And that was some of what was lubricating the ice and causing it to move. But underneath these areas, they were finding uh, perfect areas to build submarine bases. So not only did the Nazis build out submarine bases, as they developed more and more of their space program, they developed out a massive spaceport. After these spaceports were developed, and the Nazis had handed it over to basically the Americans. The Americans began to uh, develop more and more research and development bases in Antarctica. In the late 1950s, a treaty was signed that stated that Antarctica was only to be used for uh, peaceful research. Well, we were basically arriving and digging giant holes under the ice in, in various areas and building out these giant complexes, much like, um, I think it was called Project Iceworm back in the 1960s, where um, like in Greenland, uh, the United States Army Corps of Engineers was building out an uh, ICBM base hidden under the ice. And it was very sophisticated. I'm told that they were very similar uh, and when they were built and how they were built to uh, the buildings that were built in this program. Um, companies uh, that were given access to these R&D bases began to develop um, NBC testing, they called it, nuclear, biological, chemical testing, which in the programs usually translates into them working with clones, working with uh, different uh, chemical compounds to affect uh, how people develop psychologically or physiologically. So a lot of very, very dark scientific programs began to uh, be developed down in Antarctica and indeed are going on to this very day. The One of the biggest things that the Cabal does not want us to know about are the existence of these R&D bases and the um, all of the horrible crimes against humanity that are occurring on these R&D bases. On December 9th, 2015, William Tompkins released his epic book, Selected by Extraterrestrials. I became aware of it early in 2016, but it wasn't until he had conducted several interviews that he and I became friends and began speaking regularly. The story of William Tompkins is quite amazing. Here's a man who's 93 years old, and he gets hired right as he begins his military career in the Navy, working in a highly classified program for the United States government at the highest levels, where he was personally responsible for getting information from 23 different American spies who were embedded in the German secret space program, which apparently included bases in Antarctica. A single Navy operative went into Germany. Um, this is like 1939. He didn't believe this, but there was very strange organizations and different research groups all over, not just Germany, but in the occupied countries too. And strangely enough, Germany was putting in production 
fantastic vehicles. They didn't have wings on these aircraft. They didn't have empennage or tail. Uh, they had landing gears. Some of them were triangular shaped. Some were rectangular shaped. Some were round shaped like a saucer. And so he being, uh, being a, a spy for the Navy, found out all of these fantastic situations that were going on inside of Germany. And this is an important point. Instead of him going to his boss, coming back to the United States, he went directly to the Secretary of the Navy, Forrestal. Forrestal gets tapped on the shoulder. He gets told, don't select a Navy officer to head up these operatives. What? He's told to select somebody who had never been in Annapolis. Now, almost every Navy officer, whether they're of one star or a lieutenant commander, they've all been through Annapolis to learn how to be a Navy and, uh, officer. It turns out Forrestal is told that every book, every book in the libraries, every book in the colleges, every book in the universities, every book on this planet is misinformation. It's misinformation. So, which is initiated by the Draco reptilians as far back as 6,000 years ago. The reptilians really came into control and started to um, be able to manipulate what was going on on the face of the planet about six to 7,000 years ago. It is true that they have different masking technologies to be able to be in a room and look like a human, but usually they're in underground bases in various places on the globe, as well as in a huge area in Antarctica. The Southeast region has a large number of underground caverns that are kept extremely warm, too warm for humans by geothermal heat. It's a perfect place for all of these colonies that the reptilians have. They're basically cities, huge cities with millions of them. So, the Secretary of the Navy selects Rick Obata. He's not even an American. He comes over here with his family. He goes to school here. He does, goes to the second year in high school. He leaves school. He joins the Navy as a three, as a third class seaman, works his way up in the Navy. Now he's a commander, okay? That commander is selected by the Secretary of the Navy to head up all of these operatives to go back into Germany and find out what's going on. Because that individual had never had misinformation given to him about every technical field on the planet. Everything we learn in the establishment controlled education systems is specifically designed to program our minds away from the truth. Physics is wrong. Medicine is wrong. History is wrong. Everything we are taught in textbooks is mainly wrong. And this is done purposefully so we don't understand how to move our bodies, how to feed our bodies, what really happened in the past, what technology can really do these days. All of these things, if we learn them, would help us empower ourselves, would help us actually understand what's really going on with our reality. Now, if you were to go to San Diego and look over at North Island, 
you're going to see a tall building like this. There's a small office in the top of that building, which is a secret office for the Admiral. This is where the operatives come to. So the, the Admiral's aide comes to my barracks, taps me on the shoulder, and he only says one word, he's here. We drive over to that building, we get up to the top, we go into this conference room, a small room. Admiral Rickabata sits here, I sit here, and one of three other bosses that I have are all captains. So now I have three captains as bosses, and now a two-star admiral. He just got another raise. Wow. He just came back from Lockheed. He just came back from Scripps Institute. He just came back from all the aircraft company. Wow. Now he's got these operatives coming in. So the operative sits on the other side of the table. He discloses to us these fantastic things that Germany is doing that make no sense. Now I have eight girls and three PhDs as a group. We put together a package from what the operative brings back. Some of it is photographs. Once in a while, it's a manual, hardly any manual. A couple of manuals were not even in English, German, or any other language. They were extraterrestrial hieroglyphics. You see all of this stuff. You hear it. You understand what the Germans are doing. They, they didn't just get documents from the extraterrestrials. They got brand spanking new space vehicles. Here's one. Here's another one. Here's. They brought these. They take you inside. They show you how to drive it. So they put me in a secret laboratory, <laughs> which is designing, not flying wings like Northrop does, okay? These are just a fuselage with no wings and no tail. Half airplane, half spaceships. This is what Northrop is designing. Our first spaceships are U.S. Navy attack class submarines. We put together programs that went all the way out into the galaxy, not just this galaxy. The military industrial complex, back when they were testing a lot of the technology that they had received from the Nazis after World War II, as well as from ETs, when they were testing, doing proof of concept testing, they had attached this technology to uh, a regular submarine and then they flew it out of our atmosphere. That was the first time that they were really able to fly a vessel out of our atmosphere using electrogravitic technology. The reason that they used a submarine was, of course, because they were self-enclosed. Uh, the crews that served on them were used to serving six months or more away from home, having all of their supplies with them. And uh, they had the psychology of being able to handle those tight quarters for such a long time. The technology developed to a point to where they, and they developed the finances, this financial schemes, to begin to build out fleets of these long cigar-shaped craft. Some of them were kilometer long or longer, and they could make them longer by putting in sections. and. The sections were module, just like in modern submarines. They could take apart the fuselage and pull out sections. It could, um, a one of these modules could be set for like three or four months as a, a laboratory for a bunch of different, uh, you know, uh, scientific programs. Um, it, it, and then at its next time at port. Um, the modules are swapped out and then it's a hospital ship. The modules are swapped out the next time and it's a troop transport or it's uh, just a long haul freighter. So these ships are very modular. And in the beginning, they were using um, power systems that were nuclear. 
Then they moved to thorium type of electrical generation. And then they moved to some sort of e uh, zero point electrical generation. And that is what they currently use. This is totally unreal that this happened like in 1942 on this planet. Extraterrestrial come from who knows where out in the galaxy. Germany gets to be the country that these Draco reptilians pick out to do two types of missions. One, to remove all of the people that Hitler didn't want in his country and every one of them around the planet. Two, to take every man, woman, and child on this planet and put them in slave factories, men, women, and children, to, con to build and construct all these different types of Draco Navy space battle group ships. This may sound like insanity. This is what happened. He had concluded from what these insiders were telling him that the Germans had actually made treaties with a highly aggressive and highly negative reptilian humanoid race that they've called the Saurians or the Draco. This treaty involved the Nazis actually being given workable technology that is built with our own conventional systems. They use a sort of mercury turbine, a type of mercury called red mercury. And then they are actually able to leave the Earth. They had a settlement on the moon, they had a settlement on Mars, and they were doing this stuff as early as 1939, even before World War II actually started. As you can imagine, everybody was thinking he was crazy, but yet these insiders were reporting, literally standing there, in which you have eight foot tall, even 12 to 14 foot tall, reptilian extraterrestrials, terrifying in appearance, they smell bad, actually advising the Germans on how to build this stuff in these various bases, including that in Antarctica. Operation High Jump was an operation commissioned in 1947 that was led by Admiral Richard Byrd. And on the public level, it was said that this was a scientific exploration. But what happened was that this operation was commissioned with 33 ships, 13 aircraft, and 5,000 men. Now, this was not a scientific exploration with that many men and that many ships. What Operation High Jump actually was commissioned for was to go down to Antarctica and basically root out the Nazi installations that they had built pre and during World War II. The DC flyover was an event that occurred over successive weekends in July of 1952 in Washington, DC. And what had happened was that there was a mass sighting right over the Capitol building in Washington, DC. There was many lights in the sky. Now, many people believe that this was a UFO or an extraterrestrial incident, but in fact, it was not. It was German saucers, German craft that were flying over the Capitol building and essentially forcing the hand of the Americans to accept many of these Nazi scientists into their control structures. When many of these Nazi scientists came into America after World War II in Operation Paperclip, they infiltrated into basically every power structure in the United States, government, media, medical systems, basically everything. After World War II, James Forrestal went to Germany to tour many of the research facilities that the Germans had over in Europe, and John F. Kennedy actually accompanied him on those tours. Some believe that Kennedy was actually given information by Forrestal about secret space programs and the UFO phenomenon. And near the end of James Forrestal's career, he was also embroiled in many policy struggles within the United States government. He wanted to disclose the UFO phenomenon and the technologies associated with it. It was said that he committed suicide by jumping out of a high-rise hospital that he was staying in at the time of his death. But of course, many people are also believing that he was actually pushed out of the window and in fact assassinated to prevent him from working to disclose these technologies and UFO projects. They had a really troubled Eisenhower that passed over 
the, uh, the torch over to Kennedy, you know, before leaving the, his famous speech of, you know, beware of the misplaced powers when the industrial military complex and that only an alert, knowledgeable citizenry can protect our future liberties and freedoms. Kennedy, with his background in Office of Naval Intelligence, and documents show that he was aware all the way back to 1942 of operations happening. Kennedy uh, had Alan Dulles as the CIA director finding the nefarious activities that Alan Dulles was doing, he eventually fired Dulles and was replaced with John McCone. Because Kennedy was trying to look into these activities, Alan Dulles set up an assassination directive that was revealed in what was called the Byrne Memo, one of uh, James Jesus Angleton's memos that they were attempting to try to destroy all. One intelligence operative was able to pull it, basically saying that uh, Lancer, or the code word for JFK, has been looking into our activities. This we must not allow. This group was working with the group that was with the Treaty of 1955. So when Kennedy put forth a top secret document to the CIA director looking into the MJ-12 and uh, CIA operations with the extraterrestrial, uh, he was silenced uh, with, a, with an assassination 10 days later. Years went by. Uh, by the way, the Warren Commission, which, you know, Kennedy's famous piece of, of, of uh, infiltrated uh, monolithic conspiracy and beware of the dangers of secrecy and secret societies. Ironically, the Warren Commission, who said, you know, we have a lone gunman that did this, uh, was all made up of 33rd degree Freemasons. And afterward, uh, the CIA put out a memorandum to its operatives to use the term conspiracy theorists for anybody questioning. And it's used today as a, as a common ploy to discredit people who are questioning the, the situation. The closest we ever came to having technologies and the existence of non-terrestrials go public was actually in 1962-63. I am told through Alliance sources that President Kennedy was indeed going to make some announcements and also make announcements that he was going to take drastic steps against some of these secret societies that were running the planet. Therefore, they worked through the CIA to have him eliminated. When he was eliminated in a very public way, the cabal came into power in a very public way. They had been controlling things very covertly up until that point. But since then, they have overtly controlled the destiny of the United States. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are gonna go watch. I'm sure they are, I don't know, I haven't seen the web. Number 322? <laughs> <laughs> Yale University is 300 years old this year, and were you to visit its campus, you would see that it still has exotic clubhouses, which look like tombs where Yale's legendary secret societies meet. 
The videotape provides a grainy glimpse into what appear to be the initiation rituals of a secret society that's been around since 1832, whose members have gone on to be leaders of Wall Street and the White House, the Senate and the Supreme Court. What they captured, they say, was initiates, known as neophytes, being forced to kiss a skull, then members performing a mock killing. Still, Rosenbaum says the tape is a valuable artifact, an extremely rare view into the secret society that groomed the American ruling class for generations. Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. We see the remains of humans with elongated skulls all over the world. When you look at Egypt, there are countless depictions of the pharaohs having these weirdly elongated skulls. This includes Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and their daughter Meritaten. In the case of Meritaten, there are multiple granite busts that you can see that were carved of her in which she clearly has no hair and has this freakishly elongated skull. And remember, this is a culture that was apparently building pyramids at the time that these sculptures were made. The people with the elongated skulls had apparently been keeping their lineage secret and hidden in the Egyptian priesthood. But then remember that Egypt became weak and it was conquered by Rome. What happened when the Romans got in there is that they made a secret agreement with these people in the Egyptian priesthood who still had the elongated skulls and they created a safe haven for them in the Vatican City. The Library of Alexandria was burned down, but only with a false flag where they burned tax documents and census documents. They took all the good stuff that included books from before they came to Earth and relocated that to the Vatican Library. Then you go across to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and once again, you have a pyramid building culture in Mesoamerica with people depicted in their inscriptions who have elongated skulls. And unlike the case of Egypt, with Mesoamerica, we now have the added benefit that there are multiple elongated skulls that have been dug up and were not censored, but are actually on display in museums in places like Bolivia. We have the researcher Brian Forster, who is bringing out new examples of elongated skulls, and they are being genetically tested, they're being analyzed, and they have clear physiological differences from the skulls that the rest of us have. These people have very large brains. Discover Magazine in the year 2009 came out with an article called What Happened to the Hominids Who Were Smarter Than Us? And it describes how in the early 20th century, elongated skulls were found in Boskop, South Africa, thus earning them the name the Boskop Skulls. And they were given ceremonial burials. Apparently these people were revered in their society. But the article claims that the brain volume is almost twice what ours would be, and thus the average person in their society would have an IQ of 150, and some of them could have an IQ that goes up to 300. These weird elongated skulls were also found in a dig in Siberia in a town called Omsk, and the men who dug them up were so afraid that many of them actually started crying and left their jobs and refused to come back. We furthermore see in the case of the Mongolian conquerors that there were reports of them having weird elongated skulls. And most recently, even in Europe, we have found tombs of the nobility, the wealthy people who preserve their bloodlines, such as in France. And they also have this bizarre elongated skull feature. It wasn't until insiders started talking to me that I thought about the fact that in the Vatican, you see people wearing these miter hats, and those hats would very nicely conceal an elongated skull. These people with elongated skulls would look like us in their faces, and the hat would conceal the only thing that would make them appear to be different. My research also turned up data on an Italian noble family from the 14th century known as the Diest clan, and the Diest clan had very close ties to the Vatican. What's so bizarre is when you look at a painting of Prince Leonello Diest and someone who is either his sister or his wife, the scholars don't really know, they usually call her Princess Diest, they both have 
freakishly elongated skulls in this painting. The story gets even more interesting when you trace the descendants of the Diest clan, the lineage that they left behind. For what you find is that King George I, who began ruling in 1714, was a direct bloodline descendant of these people who obviously had the elongated skulls in the 1400s. And then you find out that a variety of earlier British consorts, meaning nobility, also were direct descendants of the DS clan. Then it gets even more outrageous when you discover that the royal families of Norway, Sweden, Spain, and Denmark are all descendants of the same elongated skull DS clan. And let's not forget that only recently we found royal tombs in France and other countries in Europe in which the nobility again had these elongated skulls. And if you think this only has to do with divine right of kings and European nobility, you would be wrong. In 1988, an article in the New York Times traced fully 13 out of all of the 40 US presidents at the time as having a direct bloodline connection to European nobility. In 2012, a 12-year-old girl named Brigitte d'Avignon actually did a much more complex genealogical study of the U.S. presidents using the power of the internet and computers. On the school watch tonight, the story of a seventh grader from Salinas who claims to have made a major discovery about President Obama. She and her grandfather say that President Obama is related to all but one U.S. president. And she found that 42 out of 43 U.S. presidents all had a common ancestor in King John I from England. And this is not just any old king. This is the guy who actually chartered the Magna Carta, which became the defining element that turned into the British Constitution. Davinio says she spent countless hours on the internet over the summer researching the lineage of our president, a project that started with her trying to trace her own family tree. But I'm the first historian to do all the presidents. So that's almost all of the U.S. presidents that we've ever had. The bottom line is these people are tracking their lineage, they're tracking their bloodline, and they're making sure that their own people get steered into the positions of the highest power and influence worldwide, including the United States of America. Within secret societies, there can be both good and bad people, white hats and black hats. So many of these secret societies are, of course, involved in very dark practices. But there are also secret societies out there that are harboring knowledge and information and technology to keep it out of the hands of the deep state or the black hats or the people that would do detriment with these technologies. Some of the, I guess, very well known elites, uh, names I won't mention, but uh, are on the front lobes of most watching this video, are highly involved not only in some of the slave trade aspects, but are also involved in dealing with non terrestrials and dealing with. Uh, organized crime down here on Earth and how it's related to these programs. I will tell you, Director Deutsch, as a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. <laughs> Director Deutsch, I will refer you to three specific agency operations known as Amadeus, Pegasus, and Watchtower. I have Watchtower documents heavily redacted by the agency. I was personally exposed to CIA operations and recruited by CIA personnel who attempted to recruit me in the late 70s to become involved in protecting agency drug operations in this country. For the record, my name is Mike Rupert, R-U-P-P-E-R-T. I did bring this information out 18 years ago and I got shot at and forced out of LAPD because of it. I've been on the record for 18 years nonstop and I'll be happy to give you, Congressman, anything that I have. Um. A lot of these elite are running a lot of financial uh, scams, drug uh, uh, programs to raise money for uh, these, these secret programs that they have going on. And they take full advantage of this access. They probably don't age anymore. And we, you know, a one percenter, you don't know who they are. You don't even know what they look like. You don't even know their name. They could go down and be in a 7-Eleven, you wouldn't even know it. So 
they could not age and you wouldn't know it. Never get sick. Um, offsprings would be born. They'd be super smart, super strong. Just quality of life improved in every direction. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the one percenters are enjoying that. While the rest of us are dying with diseases and, and malformities and stuff, they're walking around, you know, body beautiful. So that's, that's just the medical area. Then and think about the other things, transportation, um, the vehicles they travel around, uh, home, security, all that stuff. Just, you know, it'd be like somebody in modern su suburbia looking at a man in a cave. We're the men in the cave. What very often occurs is that uh, an elite will get to a very old, ripe age, or they will, and die, or they will die in some sort of an accident, publicly. Privately, they are taken, and depending on their level, they are either age regressed, or they have their consciousness basically downloaded into uh, a clone that is an exact, an exact duplicate of them. They then disappear from uh, the public eye forever and go into these programs or go into retirement. This is something that uh, pops up a lot in the programs, and everyone that is served deeply knows that the elite have access, and many of them never really die. What the deep state or the cabal or the new world order is, is a small group of very powerful but very psychopathic individuals that have acquired a lot of money, a lot of technology, and a lot of information over the course of centuries. Definitely your politicians, the older ones, the one that are chair people, that command the power, um, one percenters, chairman of the boards, that, those people, that's they. That's ones we never know their names, don't know their faces, and they control all the power. The more you get involved in these societies, the deeper and deeper you go, the more compromised you become. You start to learn more and more of the secret teachings. You have to work really hard for the knowledge. It can take years of time. You keep accessing higher and higher levels of rank, and they keep dropping these little seeds in as you go on seeds that start to blossom in your mind and make you think differently. Ultimately, if you go far enough down this road, you will be invited to participate in things like and human sacrifice. And if you don't do it, it's the offer you can't refuse. They may actually even kill you. Once you partake in these activities, whether you like them or not, they now have leverage they can use against you. If you ever dare to speak out against this group, they have photographs, they have films, they have the footage that can absolutely ruin your life. These people, the most of them, had a Luciferian's belief. And then can everyone say, yeah, the belief does not exist, and God does not exist, all does not exist. Now, for these people, it was the truth and the reality. They served something unstoppable. They served what they called Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And I came also in these circles. Alleen ik lachte erom, want het waren voor mij gewoon klanten. He, dus ik kwam in wat ze noemden Satanskerken. Ik wou zeggen, dit, we hebben het nu over het Satanisme. Ja, oké. Okay. Ik kwam dus in Satanskerken, maar ik kwam zeg maar op route even langs, even buurten. En daar was dan op dat moment een heilige mis, hun heilige soorten mis. En dat was met blote vrouwen en wat drank en dit en dat. En ik vond het alleen maar leuk. Hmm. Ik hechtte weinig of geen geloof aan hun geloof of. Ik was er eigenlijk niet eens van overtuigd dat het überhaupt allemaal wel bestond. Het was meer een schouwspel voor jou? Ja, ik, ik zag gewoon de donkerte en de slechtheid en de diepte daarvan zit in de mens zelf. Ja. Ik koppelde het nog niet zo. Maar ook die kringen verkeerde ik dus in, omdat dat, ja, als gast zeg maar, eh, omdat ik vond het allemaal wel leuk. Al die blote vrouwen en al, al die dingetjes die daar speelden, hè? het was het vrije leven. Uh, maar er kwam een moment, toen werd ik dus uitgenodigd, daarom vertel ik dit ook, om mee te gaan doen aan offers in het buitenland.
Dat was het breekpunt. Kinderen. Oké. Okay. Dat werd je gevraagd. Ja, ik kon het niet. The reason that these elite dark occult societies sacrifice and traffic children, first and foremost, is the energy associated with it. So when a human is in the state of fear and trauma, they release a energy. And this energy can be picked up by essentially negative extraterrestrial beings, negative archonic influences, and they feed off of it. They literally feed off the energetic release of fear and trauma. When these dark groups use children, because a child is not mentally programmed yet, as an adult is, they are much more innocent. They're much more connected into their higher selves or into their divine, if you will. The trauma that they release is much more potent than using adults. During these ritualistic practices that the elite participate in, one of the compounds that is released in the children's body during torture, during trauma, is a compound called adrenochrome. It's released out of the adrenal gland during highly traumatized incidents. And this adrenochrome acts as essentially a drug these secret societies that make up the deep state are nothing new. This actually spans back thousands and thousands of years, and they have always occulted this information for themselves. We, we need to understand what occulted actually means. Occulted just simply means hidden in Latin. It doesn't necessarily mean good or bad, it just means hidden. So these secret society groups have hidden or occulted this information for thousands and thousands of years. They've kept it to themselves and they haven't shared it with anybody outside of their inner circles. The secret societies are really more of a front organization that they use to recruit people and they will gradually over time find out exactly how ruthless and bloodthirsty you are. It is only as you go farther and farther into this, you become embedded with your brothers in a brotherhood you become more and more involved, you get deeper and deeper in, that then they start hitting you with the really heavy stuff. Until we face as a society that these things are actually happening and that there is a centralized control group that is responsible for this, we will be doomed for these people to continue to exert their control over us. If we don't learn how to respect each other, then we're never going to make any progress. We need to learn from the Me Too movement and understand that there is corruption, there is rape, there is pedophilia, there is child trafficking, there is human sacrifice, there is cannibalism. And all of these things are happening because there is a hidden elite that actually uses these behaviors as part of their religious sacrament. It actually doesn't matter whether you believe that these people exist or not. The bottom line is, that they are actually advertising themselves constantly. They do it in movies. There's a whole set of symbols that you can look for in movies that show their influence. They do it in video games. They do it in television shows. They do it in music videos like crazy. They do it in awards ceremonies. And it's always in your face. Now is the time for us to get our heads out of the sand and understand that even if these things do seem unthinkable to us, there are people today who are actively practicing this. The evidence is voluminous, and really what it boils down to is that people don't want to look at the evidence because it is so upsetting. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? Solar Warden, went active 
1980-1981. It was funded in large part by SDI uh, through President Reagan, though that money was funneled off in many different programs. Solar Warden was developed to do exactly what its namesake says, to police our um, solar system. This, we were now able, we had the technology to prevent these uh, interloper ET races from coming into our solar system, grabbing our people and leaving. We could now stop them. So Solar Warden was developed and began to do its job of policing the solar system. At the same time, we had in the interplanetary corporate conglomerate, which is made up of all of these military industrial complex corporations, we have all of these other programs that are developing technology at the same time and are developing much, much more advanced technologies. So advanced, in fact, that there are ET races that come here to trade for our technology. Corey Good is the one insider I found whose testimony ties all of these different threads together. I've heard Corey have knowledge of something that each of the different other insiders I've spoken to had said to me in the past. Nobody else had ever done that before. And that was fascinating because I had not put this information online. The information was proprietary. It was things that I'd heard over the course of conversations that could have gone on for many, many dozens of hours over time spreading across about 20 years worth of my own past history. I think they chose children for these MyLab programs in several different ways. They had to profile them. They definitely used standardized testing and a few other ways to identify whether they had a skill or a, uh, a talent that they needed. Then they would check out their family life. They preferred children from broken homes or from homes that uh, were not uh, harmonious because uh, the children are used to getting smacked around, they're used to stressful environments, and, uh, and, and the parents were not always as attentive as other parents. Therefore, the children were able to handle a lot more stress and the parents uh, may not notice you know, certain behavior in the kids. Well, I guess you would say a typical day, if there is a typical day in the life of a MyLab, would be your parents dropping you off at school, just like any other day. And except that day, you're pulled aside and told you're gonna go on a field trip. You're in a special education class or a, uh, an accelerated learning class, and you're special. You're being taken off campus to go you know, look at dinosaurs. Well, you are, taken, put in a van. Usually a person is driving that is military looking, sometimes in uniform. They would then drive us for a little over an hour to Carswell Air Force Base. We parked inside this hangar that was a motor pool and we walked to the back and there was an elevator and the elevator went down quite a ways. And when we came out, we were underground in a Cold War era type um, bunker that would then lead us to another set of elevators that would take us down where we would get on underground trams that would, uh, there were trains that would take us over 500 miles per hour anywhere in the world. When we were sent to one of these locations through one of these shuttles, we would then go through, sometimes because of travel time, we would only get 45 minutes of training in, sometimes two, three hours of training in, then we would go back be debriefed and they would give us a chemical through a shot and they would sit us in a chair in front of a movie screen and basically hypnotize us and give us a screen memory of going to a museum and looking at dinosaurs. They would then put us in the same van, drive us back to school, let us out. And uh, as our parents picked us up, we would tell them all about looking at dinosaurs. MKUltra was a program done by the CIA in the 1950s and 60s, and within MKUltra, they experimented with trauma-based mind control through the use of electroshock therapy, through the use of mind-altering drugs, through the use of even hypnotic regression, and many other techniques to figure out how to control and program human beings. Uh, there, were, there was programming at bases, uh, they used military bases 
um, because they won't have any interference uh, when they have someone on a military base. And a lot of my programming took place on a military bases. Uh, I would like to talk about the fact that there are rituals done at the military bases also, and that rituals are not a cover. The people that do the mind control are involved, and very rituals are very much a part of how they do things. For example, naval intelligence members or people that are in naval intelligence are usually very involved with Ordo Templi Orientis. And that doesn't mean that everyone in naval intelligence is involved in that. But naval intelligence is responsible for a lot of overseeing of ritual activity in this country and they are responsible for a lot of this going on there are other organizations other um, agencies involved but naval intelligence is very involved we were taken to some kind of facility out on the nevada desert and for, for a long time i thought it was area 51 but there was also another underground facility at Tonopah. So either Area 51 or the Tonopah facility was taken to a medical dispensary type of place. And I was sat down in a waiting room with the lights off. Everything they did seemed to be to cover memory, to make sure that if anybody did remember anything, being in a room with the lights off, you wouldn't be able to see the people clearly, things like that. I was given fatigues to wear that night uh, with no rank insignia, no name tags, no identifying marks of any kind. Was forbidden to speak to the other people that I was out there with uh, beyond what was necessary to run the test. So the situation they put us in was very isolating and very frightening, uh, terrifying actually. And uh, so we got to this facility, we sat down in this waiting room with the lights off and I still see it really clearly. I could draw a picture. And uh, one by one, we had to go off to the side in this little room. Finally, they called my name and I went into the little room and it was a small room. There was a, a security guard in there in uh, desert camel fatigues wearing a sidearm. He was standing at parade rest. And, um, and I was told to lay down on this stainless steel examining table that looked old, like it was maybe from the 40s or 50s. And uh, I laid down on there fully clothed. I didn't have to take anything off. And I waited for a long time with that security guard watching me. And finally, some guy in a white lab coat came in, the same door I had gone in uh, to the room in. And he said, stay calm three times in this really deadpan, monotone voice. And uh, he walked past the security guard up the right side of the table, got up to the right side of my head, and then uh, he had a hypodermic needle hidden in the sleeve of his lab coat, and he injected me in the side of the neck right here. And whatever the chemical was went straight to my brain. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of in shock from whatever this injection's doing to me because it went straight to the brain and I was like, you know, in shock. Um, suddenly there's two guys on either side of that table pulling me up by the arms and uh, dragging me off the table and down this, through this doorway where there was a long flight of stairs going down. And for some reason, I remember it as one long flight going down, not switchbacks like a lot of store cases are. It was just straight down. They half carried me, half dragged me down those stairs. And at the bottom of the stairs, there was like this little room that had a, a one-way mirror in it. And, uh, and I went through the effects of that injection in that room. And I felt like, uh, I've described it so many ways down through the years. Um, 
It was kind of like feeling like your body's turning to soda pop fizz or beer foam. It's just uh, like, you know, when your leg goes to sleep and it comes back and there's all the pins and needles and tingling and everything else like that. It was like that was happening to my whole body. It, but but super duper intense pins and needles. And, and I just curled up on the floor and just screamed because it was just doing this number on me, you know? And, uh, and I felt like I was coming apart somehow. I don't know why or how I thought that, but that's how my body felt. It felt like it was just gonna come apart and run down a drain in the floor. And I had a feeling that because the, that mirrored thing on the wall, I think it was a one-way mirror, and they were looking at me through the mirror to watch me go through the effects of this. And I racked my brain to try to come up with some idea of what this injection was and what it was for. And the only thing I've been able to come up with is maybe they were trying to create a chemical version of ascension. One of the technologies that I was exposed to while in the MyLab programs were the chemical cocktails they would use on us. They would use them to enhance us in many different ways. Some of the ways that we would be enhanced would be if they discovered we had an intuitive empath ability. There was a cocktail that they would give us that would enhance it, make it many fold stronger. They would also give cocktails to people that would, uh, they would be, they would have hormones in them that would make them stronger, faster, and think quicker. Major part of the program was that when you started, they were not quite sure where they would send you. A lot of the kids that were in these programs, they would end up in different syndicates here on the earth working for the cabal, and a small percentage, very small, would end up going into a secret space program. Certain children were picked who had certain DNA, and um, wow. I was connected with that. And what, 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 what they did was, when we were like five and six years old, they took us there, and um, they trained us, and we did, um, we learned and we trained, and we did all sorts of operations when we were there. Now, when I was five years old, my parents moved to Los Angeles at the time, out of the blue, out of the blue, and I lived on, I, I was living on Sepulveda Boulevard, and the Mars jump rooms for children are, were on at, at 999 Sepulveda Boulevard. I now know. So, um, and along, and I didn't know, so I had these memories before I, I knew that this particular information about these Mars jump rooms on Sepulveda Boulevard. It was a lot of training. So, so say from five years old to 25 years old was spent there. And I, and I know some of the people, some of the, uh, some of the people now who are back here, but what they did then at the end of the um, uh, Mars, uh, at the end of that thing is they used age regression mm -hmm. technology, brought us back to five years old and then placed us exactly back to where we were. The reason so few went into the secret space program was that most of the participants, almost all of, of the participants are pulled from various military branches. They um, bring people in to the, to the military, send them through training, testing, find out where their skills lean and if they have the fortitude for this type of mission. And then they're invited in or drafted in and they'll serve a 20 year term. And this is referred to as a 20 and back. And after that 20 years, they're actually age regressed and regressed back in time using the technology that was handed to us by non-terrestrials. And then they were buttoned up in time and placed back in their life. And then they finish out the rest of their military term and then return to civilian life, having no memory of serving in the secret space program. The whole point of regressing people back in time after serving in the 20 and back and wiping their memory has to do with a deal that was made with an extraterrestrial group that gave us that technology. There's, there's a Nordic group that are engaged in a time and space battle with a reptilian group. This battle's gone on for many thousands of years. 
When delving into this research, some people formulate ideas that there's only good extraterrestrials here or there's only bad extraterrestrials here. But we need to understand that the law of polarity is universal. There's both good or benevolent extraterrestrials here to help us and there's negative extraterrestrials here to essentially feed off of us and traumatize us into a state of fear. These negative extraterrestrial species involve some gray species. They also involve many reptilian species and many non-physical archonic entities that can also remotely influence and utilize much of that fear energy and traumatized energy that we release. Towards the end of my training, it started to become pretty clear that I had done very well in the intuitive empath training. I'd done very well in the rest of the, the general training that I was given. And I was starting to be introduced to non-terrestrial beings. So it became very obvious that I was gonna be interacting with non-terrestrials and I assumed it was gonna be in, in an off-world environment. Little did I know that I was gonna be drafted in this program when I was 16 years old. And it was during my Christmas break between the age of 16 and 17 years old, I turned 17 in February, I was taken from my room. I was then taken to Carswell Air Force Base. I was then transported to the moon where I sat and signed a bunch of papers that were uh, non-disclosures, were uh, just a big stack of papers signing my life away when I wasn't even 17 years old yet. The Lunar Operations Command is a moon base, and it was built out originally by the Germans in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Um, while they were building this um, complex, they had utilized an ancient alien building that was not too terribly far away. They had found a bunch of these buildings on the moon, and they had found one of the buildings that they were able to patch up with some of the concrete they made from the local regolith. They then were able to pressurize it and use it as a base of operations while they built out the Lunar Operation Command. After a number of years and uh, after Operation Paperclip, it uh, uh, served its purpose and integrated the Nazis into the military industrial complex the LOC was handed over to the Americans. When approaching the moon from Earth in an electrogravitic craft, you will find the moon will be at a distance and then it will grow very quickly in front of you. And then the next thing you know, you are above the surface. You will then fly in the electrogravitic craft at breakneck speeds, except you don't feel inertia. You find yourself hugging maybe 90 feet, 300 feet above the lunar surface, going at incredible speeds until you reach a crater. And then you find yourself orbiting a crater. The person piloting the craft radios in, requesting permission to land. You don't see anywhere to land. All of a sudden, a little haze kind of occurs, and then there's a base, it's a Lunar Operation Command. And as you fly down and over, there is um, a control tower where they uh, control the air traffic. As you fly around this base to make your final approach, you see a secondary crater. And as you fly down into that crater, it's fairly deep and you end up popping out into a lava tube section where you immediately see a giant building built into the middle of that lava tube that blocks it. And it's built kind of like the shape of a bell. And it looks like uh, the outside of a battleship almost, the way it's built. You then fly in and land in the bay and you're now at the Lunar Operation Command. Well, some of the testimony that's come to me over the last year in particular has been um, nothing short of startling in terms of um, 
the degree to which the space program, the secret space program, has expanded. Um, I've talked to people who have said that uh, there is uh, and has been an ongoing um, extrasolar planetary colonization program that's been going on for decades and decades. I mean, to the point where one of the people who had actually gone, and now this was the claim that he made, that he was on a warp-capable spacecraft that went from here to the edge of the Andromeda galaxy in 20 minutes, and that when they got there, they located at least eight Earth-like planets in some of the star systems along the edge of the galaxy, and eight of those planets had human life on them. They were Earth-sized planets with Earth, well, sun-like stars, stars similar to our sun, at approximately the same distances. Uh, they wound up um, using uh, some kind of radio telemetry sensors to determine uh, which ones were broadcasting in conventional radio and television signals. They found two planets like that, two of which were speaking English. And the minute I heard this, I thought, well, this is complete baloney, or this system, this whole program has been going on for a lot longer than anybody would have dreamed. But he described seeing cities and roads and cars and people and, and you know conventional clothing speaking English. And, and there's only one way that that's possible, I mean, other than you know parallel universe type of a scenario. And that is that the program has been going on for much, much longer. Right after about the six year mark in my 20 and back experience, I found out some very disturbing details that no one on the ship knew about. And, well, almost no one. I was approached by a petty, petty officer wheeler, someone who I honestly had a crush on, and she used that to her advantage. She needed me and an engineer to help her get into a room, a restricted room, and look into some pods. She wanted to know what was in those pods. She had a bad feeling. Well, I uh, helped, we helped her get in, and I was standing watch. She and the engineer opened up one of the pods, and they were uh, cryogenic chambers, <clears throat> and they were full of people that had basically been treat, looked like they'd been filleted and cleaned and sent to the market. While I saw this a little bit from a distance, so gas was escaping from this pod, and it overcame the petty officer and the engineer, and they collapsed. And before, as I was turning to run through the door I was watching through, I collapsed. <clears throat> After I came to in uh, the sick bay, they had explained that the two others had died in the accident and that I was being held for debriefing. I was then debriefed, told not to repeat the information to anyone else. If I wasn't a valuable intuitive empath, my fate would have been much different. So they sent me back to my regular duties and told me that from time to time, I was gonna be pulled over uh, to work uh, on a different deck on uh, a different project. And this project was basically a galactic slave trade. <clears throat> it turned out that um, for many decades, while we were developing technology to uh, try to fight some of the negative ETs, there were extraterrestrials that were coming into our solar system, were coming to our planet, would swoop down and kidnap people and leave and then take them and trade them off into some sort of galactic slave trade that's going on. After a while, the benevolent powers that be decided, you know what, this is a commodity. If we start calling our own people and trading them off to these extraterrestrials, we can get trinkets, we can get technology, we can get biologicals, and that's what happened. They would trade human beings for biological samples, much like what Emory Smith would end up receiving in his lab and uh, doing different experiments on. And uh, they would um, also get technology and they would trade the humans off. The humans would um, go off to be used in any number of ways. Humans are very uh, coveted, not 
people are only leaving to be food for reptilians. You know, that's a small percentage. Most of them are being used for their skills. Humans are very well known for our engineering, our creativity, our ability to uh, uh, bring things from our mind and, uh, and create them and engineer them. And strangely enough, um, we are coveted and used in that fashion. So the Cabal Group has been basically utilizing human beings as a resource. So as little pe groups of people from all of these different programs started to join and work very quietly and secretly to uh, not only find out the full truth of what was going on, but find a way to combat it. The SSP Alliance is a very small fraction of the overall uh, secret space program or secret space programs, you know, under 1%. So the only technology that they have is what they brought with them when they defected. It is a ragtag group that is doing their best to bring full disclosure to humanity. They don't want a slow, protracted disclosure. They want all of these technologies given to all of humanity at once, not to any one group, any one country, to everyone at once. And that is what the Secret Space Program Alliance has been working for. The collective story that these insiders have shared with me is much bigger than where the UFO community had been going up until then, and thus it has utterly revolutionized the whole basic discussion of what everyone is now talking about. Whether they agree with it or not, everyone has had to deal with the concept of the secret space program. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. On September 10th, 2001, the day before 9-11, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld testified in front of congressmen about $2.3 trillion missing from the Pentagon. In 2015, an Inspector General report came out detailing that that number grew from $2.3 trillion to $6.5 trillion missing from the Pentagon. This money is going into unacknowledged projects both above our heads and below ground, into deep underground military bases and secret space programs with technology far beyond what many of us could even realize. Our black budget, for instance, garners $1.023 trillion every two years. It's over $500 billion a year. Right now, there are 131 active deep underground military bases in the United States. There's 1,477 of them worldwide. Each one has an average cost of 17 to 19 billion dollars. Each one is uh, built in the site, uh, oh, it used to be, it'd take a year to two years to build each one. And now they're capable of building a couple of them a year. Uh, with sophisticated methods. Area 51 is only one base, one of the 131 bases. Of these 131 bases, I call Area 51 a mega base. It's got more than one base in it. It's Tonopah Test Range, Area 51, S2, S4, Groom Lake, and a host of others. Now, these mega bases are gobbling up our gross national product. Right now we're spending 28% of the gross national product on building underground bases solely. China has built 50 different ghost cities that collectively are built to hold an estimated 64 million inhabitants. The apartment buildings, the roads, all of the infrastructure, all the plumbing, all the electrical, everything you need for a city, and there's nobody there. 50 cities, 64 million people. Now remember, China's gross domestic product is $11.2 trillion. They're not even spending a majority of their gross domestic product on these ghost cities, and yet they have the money to do it. It's only cost them a few trillion dollars. So once you start thinking about it that way, 
you start to see how much money a thousand billion dollars really is. A billion dollars is a lot. If you're a billionaire, you can do anything you want. A thousand billion dollars is a sum of money that just gets dropped out there with this word trillion, but we're not really thinking about how it literally can build an entire civilization. The articles on China's ghost cities refer to it as China's multi-billion dollar debt, not a debt in the trillions. In fact, in 2016, one estimate that I saw showed that the total estimated debt that China has gone into to build these ghost cities is only $2.5 trillion. Now that's 50 different cities that hold 64 million people, just because they think that as they continue to have a population boom, that they need to have a place where these people can eventually go. But literally nobody is there right now. So imagine what that means when you start tossing around a figure of the two big to fail banks needing a bailout that according to Senator Ron Paul was $29 trillion. You're talking about over 10 times the amount of money that China needed to build 50 different ghost cities that can hold millions and millions and millions of people. So then the question is, where did all this money go? The total amount of money in the world in the 2008 year of the collapse, the gross world product or GWP, was only $60 trillion. So the theft of 29 trillion from the printed out of hot air US dollar is half of the wealth of the entire world. Try to wrap your head around this because what I'm telling you is, from all the insiders I've been speaking to for the last 20 years, they are building civilizations. It's just not above ground where we see it on the surface of the planet. There is vast amounts of underground drilling. There are huge caverns 20, 30 miles wide that they've built out into gorgeous, elaborate cities and they're building entire civilizations on planets and moons in our solar system. This is where the money is going. Well, I have a copy of the Inspector General Act here in front of me, and it says, among other things, that it's your responsibility to conduct and supervise audits and investigations relating to the programs and operations of your agency. That's correct. So I'm asking you if your agency has, in fact, according to Bloomberg, extended $9 trillion in credit, which, by the way, works out to $30,000 for every single man, woman, and child in this country, I'd like to know, if you're not responsible for investigating that, who is? At this point, we're at the very, we're conducting our lending facility project at a fairly high level and have not gotten to a specific level of detail to really be in a position to respond to your question. Have you conducted any investigation or auditing of the losses that the Federal Reserve has experienced on its lending since last September? We're still in the process of conducting that review until we actually you know, go out and, and gather the information, I'm not in a position to really respond to, to the specific question. So are you telling me that nobody at the Federal Reserve is keeping track on a regular basis of the losses that it incurs on what is now a $2 trillion portfolio? Until we actually look at the program and have the information, we are not in a position to say whether there are losses or to respond in any other way to that. Mr. Chairman, my, my time is up, but I have to tell you honestly, I am shocked to find out that nobody at the Federal Reserve, including the Inspector General, is keeping track of this. What's amazing is that right now we're seeing the very first audit of the Pentagon ever. And this audit could very well begin to expose the trillions and trillions, upwards of even 21 trillion, if not more money than that, begin to be exposed. And we might even find out very soon where the, all this money actually went. Let's go back now to the LIBOR scandal that happened in the wake of the 2008 economic collapse. LIBOR is an acronym that stands for London Interbank Offered Rate. And what we're finding is that these two big to fail banks are only appearing to be in competition with each other. The LIBOR scandal revealed that these guys are calling each other on the phone, colluding about how to rig their own interest rates so that one appears to be winning, one appears to be losing, but they're actually like branch offices of a single larger corporation. All of the apparent competition, oh, these guys' stock is going down. Oh, it's a bloodbath. No, 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 no. They're doing all this together. They're competing only on paper when in fact 
It's collusion. This is financial organized crime on such a massive scale. How can you arrest all the banks? They're too big to fail. This gets into a law that was passed in the United States in 1970 called the RICO Act, which stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations. And that act was built to be able to take down massively organized crime. None of this really makes sense until you get back into the idea of the Federal Reserve System. Now, up until the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913, the United States essentially was in control of its own currency. This same banking cartel that we've been talking about worked behind the scenes to create a series of fake economic crises in the late 1800s and early 1900s, which caused regular Americans to have their savings wiped out. This became such a crisis that people were desperately calling for reform. And then the government comes along and says, look, we're bribed corrupt politicians. We don't really know what we're doing. They have spokespeople saying these kinds of things in the media. Let's bring in the investors. Let's bring in the British bankers, the people who really know how to make money. They've been doing it for a long time. They're not just gonna hold an office for a few years and go disappear. They are the guys who really understand how to run a financial system. So what did we do? We handed over the issuance of American currency to a private corporation of private bankers. When you see Federal Reserve note on the US dollar, that means it's printed by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, since they came into power just over a century ago, has eroded the purchasing power of the US dollar by 99%. So what was really going on there? Do you think that these investors built up the equity of the United States, made us more profitable? It's exactly the opposite. We have been living in a prolonged economic depression. They just don't call it that because the metrics that we use to measure the economy are coming from a rigged system, just like we saw with LIBOR. Don't bother to look at the Dow Jones. Don't bother to look at the NASDAQ. That has nothing to do with the reality of everyone else and how hard it has become to earn a living. The complete wiping out of the middle class. You have rich and you have poor. And even among the rich, you then have super rich people where a concentrated small cluster of individuals have so much wealth that it could feed entire nations, entire peoples. So this is something that is an economic inequality that must be addressed. And the only way that we're ever really going to learn this is by a collective, massive understanding. I say the elite powers in control, which is nothing, which is really the same as these uh, central banking dynasties that are basically sitting o on, over the nations. They are a form of global government, except that they are not government at all. They're just dominance. They are dominance. They are the ones that issue the orders to all the nations. Uh, as we saw clearly in 1947, after Roswell, we saw these elite powers in control issue these orders to all the nations that anything real that comes up in, in regards to alien visitors or UFOs must immediately be covered up at all costs, no matter what. And that was the first, uh, that was how that wall, uh, the embargo of truth, that Berlin Wall went up originally in 1947. And that's an example of them in action over the nations. And that's the reason why, why disclosure and the images that conjures up in our minds is not a real thing, really, because the nations, whether you're talking about the United States or any place else, they don't have the actual agenda of aliens to reveal. They don't, they're not on the inside of that. They really aren't. The nations just follow orders. That's all they do. And that's what they're doing now, and that's what they always do. And when you see them all doing something strange or something that seems out of the ordinary, uh, it's because they're following the orders of the elite powers in control. We stand at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to free the Earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our 
divisions. It's time to remember that old wisdom our soldiers will never forget, that whether we are black or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. After the inauguration, the president signed a number of secret memorandums stating that he wanted the release of advanced technology that, and a lot of this technology was involved in the space program, and he was very aware of it. We know that President Trump is aware of advanced technologies because his uncle was the one who went in and cleared out the safe of Tesla after his death. So we are fairly sure that President Trump grew up bouncing on his uncle's knee hearing stories of free energy. Aside from the Secret Space Program Alliance, we have a different alliance. It is made up of all of these countries that have been fighting against this cabal for 50 years or so. It is also made up of various military groups that have broken away from the cabal, such as elements of the United States military, intelligence groups have broken away and have been participating with a lot of other breakaway groups in trying to overthrow the cabal who took over the United States back in the 1960s, around 1963. This alliance, Earth Alliance, began to get more and more organized. And they got organized to a point to where some of them approached some generals and told them that they wanted to do an open coup in the United States. These generals decided they would make one last ditch attempt to, to get rid of the cabal legally. And that's when they approached Trump, allegedly, to run for president and allow them to legally get the country back, basically. The Alliance is an international group. It is a confederacy. There are lots of different factions, some of which agree, some of which do not agree, about the only thing that they all have in common is they want to see this satanic, pedophile, elitist cabal come down in flames. They do not want these people trying to kill off most of the planet, trying to control all of this immensely high technology. The Alliance also consists of a surprising majority now of personnel in the U.S. military and in the U.S. intelligence community. So we're going to have to deal with the fact sooner or later and probably sooner that not everybody in the government is bad. This is part of the PSYOP that was put out through movies and through media to get us to completely distrust all levels of society, all of the institutions so that no one will ever be able to oppose these people. You're not gonna do this by a bunch of keyboard warriors on the internet. They're not gonna actually take the solid action that needs to be taken. What you do need to see is what we now are counting up in August 2018 as 45,000 sealed indictments. Now this is on the official U.S. government court record. You can go to the pacer.gov website, which lists all of the lawsuits and all of the indictments filed in all of the different districts in America, and just count up the sealed indictments. The official count, the undisputed count is 45,000, and the normal number for any given year is approximately 1,000. Now this is a very, very big story that people are really not seeing exactly how awesome this is. Let's talk about what do you have to do to get a sealed indictment? Okay, a sealed indictment is the result of a secret grand jury proceeding. Now, what is a secret grand jury? A secret grand jury requires a panel of 12 to 23 US citizens who are then given information and testimony from a prosecutor. The prosecutor is prosecuting a particular individual who is not invited to the proceedings, has no idea this is going on. And in legal terms, that's called ex part. So he is, he or she is 
testified against by the prosecutor, and then the jury has to decide if there is sufficient cause to prosecute this person with a crime, in which case they file a sealed indictment. The indictment stays off the record. You don't get to know the person's name until they unseal it, at which point the person is immediately arrested. And then they get to have the regular trial by jury with a judge. But you have to understand that the prosecutor is either a federal US attorney, a county district attorney, or a state attorney general. These are big, big league players. This is not some attorney that you hire in podunk, okay? These are major players creating major indictments. And the reason why they do it this way is that they're prosecuting organized crime. Typically, that's what it is. They're prosecuting a larger ring where they can't indict one person at a time. They have to get all their ducks in a row. They have to line it all up so that when they unseal the indictments, everybody gets arrested at once and there's no ability for them to tip each other off that something happened so that the rats can flee off of the sinking ship. They all get nailed at once. The phenomenon known as Q or QAnon came onto the scene at the very end of October 2017. And what essentially occurred is that a group that called themselves Q began posting on anonymous online image boards called 4chan and 8chan. And what they were posting was a lot of questions, a lot of suggestions, a lot of very interesting and intriguing data sets that essentially laid out a real-time takedown of the deep state by Alliance and White Hat groups behind the scenes. As the QAnon briefings recently stated, these indictments are going to be like Watergate times a thousand. We've never seen anything like this in the history of the world. Some of the most recent QAnon briefings, which our insiders have told us, is coming from the Alliance have said that there are many, many figures in the controlled mainstream media who are in these indictments as well. So Harvey Weinstein is just the beginning. And isn't it interesting that when Harvey Weinstein was finally arrested, in his hand he had the biography of Elia Kazan, who was a guy in early Hollywood history who was brought in during the McCarthy investigations and sang like a songbird and ratted out many other people in Hollywood. And Weinstein has now said he is doing the same thing and that everybody in Hollywood was doing the same stuff that he was doing. So he was upset about why he got singled out. So once these indictments become unsealed, this will be the fulfillment of the mass arrest scenario that I have been leaking on my website since 2009. The only two indictments that we've had unsealed so far involved the cult group Nexium, the founder of Nexium, Keith Rainier, and one of his understudies, the actress Allison Mack. These are the only two unsealed court records so far. And their unsealed indictments actually labeled child sex trafficking on them. And Nexium has found to be a hotbed of cult activity, of ritual abuse, and of child sex abuse even. So if these are the only two records that have been unsealed so far, and they are taking down names of this caliber with charges of this caliber, we can only imagine what the rest of these unsealed indictments are going to show us. This is nothing new. It didn't start with the QAnon briefings, has nothing to do with who's president of the United States right now. This is a decades long effort in the making and they have tried and tried and tried in various ways to get this to work. They've had consistent failures and now they're being much more systematic and much more methodical. It's all gonna be done legally. All of the indictments are totally bona fide. And it's just that once this finally happens, it will be something we have never seen before in all of American history, a true second American revolution. One of the things I learned as an FBI agent is it's not that I learned to believe in conspiracies more. What I learned to know is when I am caught up in a river of deception and everybody else around me is being taken on the same current and we're all being taken in one direction, and suddenly one guy has to stick his head up and say, this isn't right. This is all wrong. We're all just being fed 
garbage and we're not being told the truth. Well, how is it that technology in today's age, our technology has moved forward by leaps and bounds in so many areas, yet we're still driving, the entire world is still driving automobile that function essentially on the same technology that they have for a hundred years. A hundred years, and we're still using fossil fuels to fill up our, our gas tanks. How is that possible that that has not moved forward hardly one iota? I mean, they blend the stuff sometimes, but I mean, essentially, that has, technology has been stuck for a hundred years. Well, that's because that's one of the one of the economic factors from the globalists that is that is so dead set against distributing real energy, which is free energy, which we know was discovered during Tesla's time. So Nikola Tesla is known, of course, for delving into free energy or zero-point energy sciences, but funny enough, near the end of Nikola Tesla's life, he was actually delving into anti-gravity research. And unfortunately, Tesla didn't have enough time nor money towards the end of his life to be able to continue his research into anti-gravity, but he passed along his knowledge to a man named Otis Carr. And funny story about that, Nikola Tesla was staying in a hotel in New York near the end of his career. And during his stay at this hotel, he befriended one of the workers that was there, and that was Otis Carr. And they courted a relationship, and Nikola Tesla actually felt comfortable enough to begin sharing some of his research with Otis Carr. Now, Otis Carr then went after Nikola Tesla's passing to develop this research out a little bit more so, and Otis Carr actually developed what was called the OCTX1, I believe, and it was actually a flying saucer craft that was piloted with the consciousness of the individual, and he did, supposedly, actual experiments that were successful in navigating both space and time with this craft. So we could say Otis Carr actually was the first person to develop a, or begin to develop a civilian-based space program. But he was essentially run out of business and was not able to continue the work he was doing because the uh, military industrial complex suppressed his work. But the same forces that destroyed that I mean, at that time, uh, supposedly it was it was Thomas Edison who was a part of the global system. I mean, he was he was the original fossil fuels and, and ele normal electricity uh, system, and he was he, supposedly he but he was just a front man to destroy Tesla and destroy his uh, because the efforts to destroy his patents came from national government, not just. Edison and his private conglomerate that had billions of dollars even at that time. Uh, and the reason for that is why? Because this effort to repress free energy was coming from the elite powers in control, the ones that sit on top of everybody and tell everybody, we gotta stop this. And what we're seeing today, of course, is that free energy is like a, it's like a dam that they're sprouted, sprouting leaks and it's getting ready to burst forward because it is coming and it's coming really soon because it's been out there for so long. And I think we're getting to the point where it is gonna come forward and it's gonna come forward maybe from several sources at the same time because the pressure has built up so much from so many different sources. So I think we are gonna get it very soon. I was asked to give a paper at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base to the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And their, their normal request would have been, tell us how you're trying to get new business using advanced technology. In other words, that was my job, to run 250 guys with different disciplines to try to get new business. But instead, I surprised them by saying, I want to give a talk called The Giant Discoveries of Future Science. And there was a moment of silence and okay. <laughs> so, so I developed this talk and in this talk, what I established was I distinguished the difference between engineering and science. Engineers being people who want to build something and make it work. They don't really care how to get there. And the scientists who want to know the quote truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I made that distinction. And then I gave examples of 10 scientific fa facts that are essentially established. You know, the 
the Earth evolved by gradual processes and that there are Maxwell's equations are the right answer and that Einstein's M E equals MC squared, that was all good. And then I took these 10 greatest achievements by the 10 scientists and asked, what, do we, what, do, what can we tell about these 10? And, and the interesting thing was that you could tell three things. Number one, not a single one of them was known in the field. <laughs> Number two, Every single one of them had been criticized by their peers as, as being stupid or charlatans. And number three, the average age was 23 when they made their discovery. Mm -hmm. So I took that thought and wrote down a list of what I thought were the 12 greatest discoveries of the future mm -hmm. that we had to attack. And, and the first one was how the UFOs work. The second was time travel, well not Time travel was at towards the end, but the processes of the brain and the mind, uh, psychic discoveries, uh, psychokinesis, that sort of thing, and a bunch of those those things were on, on the list. And the amazing thing is that today, in 2017, I am satisfied that my list that I said would maybe, and I give a probability of discovering these things, you know, 20 years from now, mm -hmm. my list was essentially already discovered, every single one, including time travel, at the time that I read gave this paper. My uh, my engine's complete, I rebuilt it. I have the entire package setting and outsourced on the servers around the planet. Uh, upon my death, the servers dump everything onto the web. And I mean everything, blueprints, schematics, diagrams, list of materials, list of tools, list of suppliers that will help you get the tools, um, dimension, three-dimensional working models. You'll be able to recon, any normal lab would be able to reconstruct this thing, get the same results I did. And uh, I want that done because that will be validation of technology. But once it's built, it's not going to set there. They're going to use it. And um, I suspect in a year's time, once that kind of technology is done, they build it, they start using it. Oil is reduced to a lubricant planet-wide, and that's it. That's the first step. Imagine what happens next. I don't want to be around. That's the reason I, I it would be a media circus, and i just not into that. So I'll just leave it behind and y'all can play with it and do with what you want. So how do we hear all of this information and not feel disempowered? How does it not feel hopeless? Well, I look back when I start to feel hopeless to the reports of legitimate ET contacts that have occurred in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. In all of those reports, the ETs asked two things. Grow spiritually or expand your consciousness and demand the release of suppressed technologies from your governments. Those are the two things that we can focus on. If we begin to organize and demand the release of suppressed technologies, they will have no choice. If we focus inwardly on whatever our religion is, becoming the best human being that we can and expanding our consciousness beyond our comfortable belief systems, when we do those two things, we are gonna gain the freedom that we desire. I started realizing that the cabal or the Illuminati or whatever you wanna call them, they keep us fighting with each other intentionally because they know that the potential in our unified consciousness, should we ever come together and stop fighting with each other, is extremely powerful. And they have been using that energy against us, like farming and managing our consciousness in such a way that we spin out a version of reality from the thoughts they program into us that makes the matrix, just like in the Matrix films. And so we have made the matrix that's our prison. We made it from our consciousness and our thought that's been managed, farmed, programmed, and controlled. And if that's true, then we have the power within ourselves 
to come together and stop fighting with each other and remake the world. And emotion is key. We're not taught anything about how to deal with our emotions in this world. It's like a big black hole and we just spurt emotional energy all over the place like an out of control garden hose. You know, would we waste money like that in most cases? Would we waste uh, gasoline in our car that way? No. Well, we need to look at our emotional energy the same way because that's the big key. And we have powerful emotions as human beings. And that means a lot of emotional power. But the only way we can wield it is to come together and find our commonalities and build on those and stop looking at our ideologies that might divide us and our beliefs that might divide us. We've got to come together. We've got to focus on the fact we're all human beings. We all have hearts and souls and conscience. And we need to look at what brings us together. And then we need to take the, the emotional energy of that love and connection and make that really, really powerful and then release it intentionally in waves of consciousness, energy, and power that can remake this world and the matrix it's based on in, in ways that we want for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren, for all the animals and the environment. We can remake it just through the power of consciousness. We can get full disclosure just through the power of consciousness. But we can only wield this energy together and we can only wield it with love for each other and the planet. We're at the early stages of this movement and every movement, you know, whether we're talking about the civil rights movement, the abolition movement, you know, the, the women's rights movement, uh, it's always once it reaches a kind of like um, uh, a, a critical mass, then the political changes happen. So this is a very, very compelling story. I do believe that it's time for all of us to take a stand. We cannot simply step back and allow all these things to happen. Even if we don't fully believe everything that the people in this movie and other insiders like them have been saying, it's worthy of our consideration. Can we really afford to be so ignorant as to turn our backs on this information? We don't have the time to sit around and argue about whether this information is true. The planet is dying. We have economic collapse. We have mass starvation. We have the largest mass extinction since the collapse of the dinosaurs. Our ecosphere is collapsing. We see the lack of water. We see ever increasing global temperatures and no one really is doing anything about it. The entrenched power structure stays the way it is. We're still burning fossil fuels. We're still not getting access to these amazing technologies. If we do get full disclosure, now the dam breaks. Now we're in a totally new reality, which very well could be the golden age that was promised to us in so many different ancient teachings and traditions. I do believe that in our lifetimes, we will see the full disclosure of the so-called forbidden technology. We will become a truly galactic civilization. And we will do this with the cooperation of people in the military, people in the intelligence community, people who were working for the cabal and have decided to break away from all that, become insiders and be the change that we want to see in the world. This film is an embodiment of that global movement. This film is the red pill that wakes you up to what's really going on in the world. They do not have the staff to fight us. The cabal is losing. We are on the winning side of history. We are moving forward step by step. And at some point, this is all going to break open. So when we raise consciousness, when we come together as a group, when we create this initiative, when we define what we want by having that be our state of mind, we are literally transforming this planet into the golden oasis that it was always supposed to be and the breathtaking future that we have been hearing about from so many ancient traditions, whether you want to call it ascension, the golden age, whatever it is, I do believe it's possible and it is up to us to co-create this amazing reality. Power in defense of freedom is greater than power in behalf of tyranny and oppression because power, real power, comes from our convictions, which produce uncompromising action. 
Every daring attempt to make a great change in existing conditions, every lofty vision of new possibilities for the human race, has been labeled utopian. Like it or not, everything is changing. The result will be the most wonderful experience in the history of humanity or the most horrible enslavement that you can imagine. We must draw our strength from the very despair in which we have been forced to live. We were born with potential. We were born with goodness and trust. We were born with ideals and dreams. We were born with greatness. We are the universe in ecstatic motion, and it does not require many words to speak the truth. The ultimate end of all revolutionary social change is to establish the sanctity of human life, the right of every human on the planet to liberty and well-being. Do not allow yourself to get lost in the fear of change. Remember, the wound is the place where the light enters you. We are here to laugh at the odds and live our lives so well that death will tremble to take us. Very importantly, I'm hereby directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. If you are willing to come forward with information regarding suppressed technologies, you can do so anonymously through secretspaceprogram.com. We have end-to-end -end encrypted communication options available and a Tor site that supports dead drops of any file types. 